It's Alex McCumbers from the Forever Classic Podcast, here to give you just a little bit of pre-information before we get going here. Some of the audio was a little challenging to mess with. I had a couple spots here and there that are just really challenging as far as the editing process. And I'm in no way, shape, or form an audio engineer. A lot of the techniques that I use may not even be the right techniques to use, and a lot of it is kind of experimenting with each episode. So if there's an audio issue, I'm sorry. Uh, we're always trying to get better. But this conversation was really cool. We had the entire development team of Scaleboy, and I think that's kind of a first for the show, and something that I definitely really appreciate. And we just had such a great time, and I hope you all enjoy this episode. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that me and Zach did both get Switch codes, so we are doing some sort of review for it. A lot of it was to get the context for the conversations that we were having in this episode. Scaleboy is available, probably by the time you're listening to this. It launches on the 30th. Do at least check out the trailer. I think it's a really cool game. We really just appreciate the time of these developers. I mean, we were talking to them from two different places in America, and they were in Germany, and our world is just cool that we can get together and talk to various creators and stuff like this. So if you like this episode, please share it with a friend. Go check out Skellboy's trailer. Find it on the Switch. It's a really cool little title, and it's only 20 bucks. So thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Forever Classic Podcast. Let's get going with that crunchy, mm, just excellent... Excellent scale boy music. Welcome to the Forever Classic Podcast, the show seeking enlightenment through video games, films, and other geek culture. I'm Alex McCumbers, one of the co-hosts. 50% of what we got going on. The other 50% is Mr. Zachary Snyder. How you doing, bud? I am doing good, but it's rainy. It is better than snow, dude. I am watching it pile up here in Alaska. (laughs) (laughs) So, Zach, this week we've got a few devs that I am really excited to have. We have Umayaki Games. And we're talking about their latest upcoming project, Scaleboy, which you and I have been playing and rather enjoying. Yeah, absolutely. I haven't played a game like this in a long time, so this has been a nice exploration. It's very cute and me getting used to old controls. Yeah, there's a simplicity there. So if you all would introduce yourselves to our listeners, you have the floor. Okay. Hi, I'm Chris. I did the programming and level design for the game. And I am Sabaku. I am the artist of the game and the writer of the game. And I am Björn. I did uh, the music and the sound effects for the game. Perfect. And if I'm not mistaken, this is most of the dev team, yeah? This That's is all, all of the, the dev, dev team. team. We've got the full load here. That's incredible. Oh, man. See, I told you we had something special today, Zach. This is great. We haven't had a full dev team on yet. Well, <laughs> well no, I don't think we have. There might have been one that was a single dev somewhere. Uh, techni- oh, yes. We have a uh, shorty here up in our dev team dev team but he's not involved in scalboy so oh right on oh okay so not all of umayaki games but we have all of scalboy very cool yeah exactly (laughs) so for anyone unaware scalboy is this like sort of zelda almost adventure game that's got a very unique art style that's kind of reminiscent of paper mario so they take a some 2d pixel art sprite work and give it 3D depth, and those end up being the characters and almost like a play sort of situation. And it's a really cool game because you're running around in a single expanded level, so all of the areas are interconnected. Think something out of Dark Souls, the original game, how all those little areas are are like spokes, so to speak. So that's kind of how Scaleboy is laid out. Uh, There's 
a news release on our website, foreverclassicgames.com, which does include things like the trailers, some screenshots. So if you want to get an idea of what the game is about, go check those out. Yeah, exactly. We really enjoy sitting down and doing these dev chats because I've always been kind of history oriented. So I really like to know like where things come from and and really add some value to just the overall information out there about games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is this is great because you don't we for me I don't normally get to hear like lots of devs talk like I get to hear a lot more indie chatter and like where people are coming from from doing these interviews and just sit down talks and some of our episodes have just been us and devs just geeking out about what they've done and. I, I like bringing that to more people. So you all being here with us makes that so much more fun. And now it's a whole like little dev team on a game. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Whew. Okay. Stakes are high. <laughs> <laughs> we try to geek as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's start with the beginning. How did Scaleboy kind of come together? So um, Scaleboy uh, had a lot of different development stages, so to speak of. The first thing that kind of came together was the art style. You have to know we all came, came from a small indie dev community around uh, an engine called RPG Maker, if that uh, is known here. Like, uh, that's a little, a little editor for people who know no programming at all. You can just uh, drag and drop stuff and make a little like Final Fantasy clone. Yeah, we have RPG Maker. I've actually played around with most of the versions that are available, and I really can't wait for the Switch version of that. Yeah, and we all were in the same community. We were not a team at the time, and I was just playing around in RPG Maker and made the first prototype that was called Cubot at the time and yeah made uh, things that later would end up in the game graphic wise i made a little character editor where you could like in scaleboy change characters give them different clothes and stuff and it was it was really a tiny prototype nothing came out of it but i met chris through that uh, little project he saw it and was like hey could make something out of that and chris at the time he was already a very epic game developer. <laughs> he, he, he like uh, would do his own game editor stuff, like programming in C++ and stuff. And he picked it up and we experimented a little bit already with a style that was like flat sprites that would, me- would move in a 3D environment. But also we laid that to the side and but we uh, stayed together and made little prototypes for game gems and stuff for very different stuff, like classical RPGs, but also like card games and stuff. We have a long list of prototypes we made at the time. And somewhere there, Bjorn joined the crew and made music for like, uh, we did a little horror game in 3D, I guess, with uh, one of uh, Chris's engines and made that for Game Jam. And after that, I think, there was another Game Jam where we at first, for the first time, did something that we really came close to what Scaleboy is today. It was like the little castle area at the beginning and a little bit walking around and killing enemies and already picking up their stuff. That was the first step for doing Scaleboy. And now we are here (laughs) and made a full game out of it. Very cool. And then eventually you guys stumbled upon Fabraz. Uh, I I think they stumbled across us. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It was the other way around. I think uh, Chris came online one day and said, like, we have a DM of someone from Fabraz and they are very interested in the game and want to port it to Switch. And we are like, what? Yeah, especially me, because I'm a total Nintendo nerd, and I yeah, w- always oh wanted Scalboy on the Switch. <laughs> this so, is really crazy, crazy stuff, because Bjorn was mocking me all the time and wanted the game on the Switch. But I said, no, Bjorn, we cannot do that. I don't have a dev kit. I don't know anyone at Nintendo. We don't do that. And then suddenly, <laughs> I, I got the DM from Fabulous. Hey, you want to get this game on the Switch? And Bjorn was, yay. I was, oh, okay, Bjorn. <laughs> 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 the day has come and it's releasing yeah. exclusively first on switch exactly right. so things have come full circle that's crazy well congrats bjorn i'm glad that you had like this awesome moment <laughs> <laughs> thank you very this much no, I'm, I'm actually super happy that the game is releasing on switch i i didn't even care that it was uh, releasing exclusively at first but you know it's always been my dream to have a game that i made something for on a nintendo console we hear oh, that that's gotta lot. be such a good feeling it's an incredible feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about everybody's history with games. What makes them special to you? Who wants to start? Should I start? You you start, I have to think. 
<laughs> <laughs> my history with with uh, video games starts at my at a tender uh, age of four years. Um, oh I had a oh, I had an old a computer story. back then. Oh my god! Uh, just this is a long story. I tried to shorten it at, at, as most as good as possible. So I'm four years old. I have a computer in my room, an Amstrad CPC, not even a Commodore or something, just a, an Amstrad, and I played with that all day long then two years later my cousin got an nes uh, for her birthday and i always <laughs> went over to my cousin to play nes and super mario brothers amazing that's when i basically became a super hardcore nintendo fanboy and just a year later i think i got my game boy and all the other consoles came out then uh basically came the day like th that's like a span of 15 years <laughs> that i'm skipping right now then came the day when we basically met up in that um indie dev community that sabi spoke about uh beforehand and yeah now we're here nice okay, okay. I, I, I next you next <laughs> no okay. you do first okay um <laughs> Uh, it's funny because I, I also like Nintendo and Sony and all these consoles, but I started as a sole PC gamer because my father was always against consoles. He was kind of like the PC master race from 20 years ago. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I just wanted to play these uh, long, epic Japanese RPGs, so I just got myself an emulator on PC, so I could play them anyway. That's how I played most of the ones I missed out on. Yeah, I mean, mm. most of these games were not available in Germany anyway, so it's a good thing I could do that. <laughs> so yeah, um, and I started really early creating my own games because I always saw these epic RPGs and I thought, man, I, I want to do that too. Uh, maybe I can do that. So I started programming in, in Visual Basic, moving sprites uh, at the age of 10 and yeah, then I never stopped. <laughs> No, I'm here. <laughs> Man, y'all got started so early. That's yeah. awesome. I mean, I started at like two. <laughs> so I totally get it. That's super early. I mean, I, I also, in my family, I have a lot of older siblings, like um, an older sister who is more of a console player and an older brother who is more like a PC player. I think I got the full load out of that. <laughs> like I was uh, sitting, I, I mostly watched my sister play in the old days. And we had like games like um, Zelda, A Link to the Past, and the Pokemon games for the old Game Boy, the gray one. I think the first game I was really invested in, even when I just was watching, was uh, Terranigma, which is a game I heavily adore to this day. Terranigma is. is very cool. Yeah, oh my god. It was so crazy. Like the ending... I think the ending of Terror Mima was something that really, I, I shed some tears over it in the, in the little age of nine years or something. Mm -hmm. I was super invested. I had similar feelings with uh, games like Legend of Dragoon and Final Fantasy IX. When I finally finished Final Fantasy IX, I was just so emotionally moved. It was such a cool oh, feeling. Oh yes. Final Fantasy IX is also one of my favorite Final Fantasy games. And I haven't played, uh, I have not much uh, Final Fantasy games I really like. But that one is really good. Oh, I love it yes. dearly. I just got a Christmas present from one of our listeners and a good friend of mine, Izzy, who's been on the show for our Zelda episode. And she sent me these super high quality Final Fantasy IX figures for Garnet, Zidane, Steiner, and Vivi. And it just makes my oh, desk yeah. look so much better. It's so oh, cool. Oh my god, I'm so jealous right so now. So good. <laughs> There's pictures on my Twitter. They're so cute. Yeah, I saw them. They're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's one of my like favorite top. Anytime somebody's like, what's your favorite game? I usually play to Final Fantasy 9. That's a good pick, yes. That's very And I good think pick, uh, yeah. games like these, like really JRPG-ish things, are the games that I like the most. And I probably because they are so... I, I was also a very excited reader at the time, like Harry Potter and stuff. And I think games like these with a very rich story are so inviting to me. I think uh, the reason why games are so important to me is like, I really like to read, I really like to write. But I also do art for as long as I can think. And in games, everything of that comes kind of together. And I think that's the reason why I like games so much. I definitely echo that because games are such an often collaborative effort. And at the end of the day, it takes so many areas of artistic expression. You have the music, you have mechanics, you have even down to the UI elements all kind of come together. And it's just kind of a miracle every time a game gets made. They're just little miracles. And I find them so fascinating. <laughs> that's, so, yeah. that, that's, mm -hmm. that's good. That sounds cute. <laughs> it sounds also very true. <laughs> it's definitely my favorite media 
being able to have like a story element into something, whether it's like a railroaded or linear story or the flexibility to pick and choose how much of the story you know from a game by playing through it different ways or in depth or very short. So it's like all the nice things rolled into one and you get this wonderful feeling or all these emotions, lots of feeling tense. (laughs) I do love a good horror (laughs) game. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. I need another good horror game. <laughs> oh, man, there are some good ones out there. Real quick, Lost in Vivo is one that's on my list to play that apparently has a lot of Silent Hill elements. People are saying it's it's a bit of a smash hit. Mm. Lost in Vivo. It's on Steam. But I guess uh, connected to games we enjoy, what games specifically kind of inspired the various elements of Scaleboy? Uh, you, you already called it. Uh, before um, the level design is heavily influenced by Dark Souls because I'm a huge fan of the series. <laughs> that makes sense. So uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I really wanted to make this huge interconnected world. I know it's also kind of Metroidvania, but Dark Souls is my main influence. I am fascinated right now with the idea of puzzle boxes. So things like the Resident Evil Mansion or some of the the better Zelda areas where like you have all these different elements that are slowly worked towards the center or something. And then that's how you like slowly works for your solution. So I've been thinking about puzzle boxes a lot while playing Scaleboy. Yeah, it's mostly the castle area and the short areas uh, around it. Yeah, so Dark Souls definitely inspired a lot of the level design. What about some of the music? Because the music is really one of the standout elements to me. Wow, thank you very much for that comment. (laughs) So um, the music basically, um, at first I asked Chris and Zabi back then when it was a Game Jam project um, what kind of style the music should have. And they were like, try something Banjo-Kazooie-ish. And I tried something Banjo-Kazooie-ish and uh, this is what came out. And you may have noticed that the main melody in each song is basically the same. Yeah. Which is just, at first it was just joke of mine and then it became very serious that I I used the main melody in every song that uh, that is in the game. Someday we just realized, wait a minute, Ron, that's just the same song over and over again. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, but it's a different style is what I always said and it's true. It it is a different style and the the basic idea I've got that from is um, from Super Mario Land 2 actually because there is like maybe three different songs but um, especially the main melody is always the same and it's always in a different style and that's what i was more or less trying to adapt in the skullboy soundtrack as well super mario land 2 has a very good soundtrack and banjo kazooie yes. is one of my favorites i mean kirk cope and, and the gang really like nailed it with that soundtrack <laughs> yeah definitely i mean i with the skullboy i basically try to channel my inner kirk Cop, you could say <laughs> and <laughs> uh, see what i can do with that and i think it worked out pretty pretty well I think it's successful. Absolutely. It's super catchy. I think we <laughs> even you. played Banjo-Kazooie uh, just weeks before or something, or, or while we were developing Scaleboy. I think we, we met up for a week in Bremen for a community meetup and played through the first uh, Banjo-Kazooie. Just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I speed ran the first level. <laughs> oh, I, I love playing that game in like the 100% fashion. It's just something that is so calming to me. Yeah. I had... Yeah. I had uh, with an old friend of mine, I had like these friendly competitions who could finish what level the fastest. I think we always bet our times uh, each other like um, for um, what's the first level, Mambus Mountain, uh, like <laughs> ten times a day. We uh, everyone's just one second faster than the other one, and then send a screenshot and all that stuff. It was fun. Whoever yeah. wins at the end of a weekend has to buy pizza. <laughs> <laughs> sort <laughs> of. <laughs> I'm like the oddball out. I've never played Banjo Kazooie. Oh my God, we're changing wow, that. You should, you should definitely <laughs> play it. You should absolutely play it. It's a wonderful collectathon. I think in the last four or five recordings we've done, it's referenced Banjo Kazooie in some way, shape, or form. So I'm like, yeah. So maybe I that's play this. a sign. Yep, yep. That's that's time time to pick it up. I was just thinking, not yesterday, that we should do an episode on Banjo Kazooie. So. Congratulations! We have a new episode topic, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned having little friendly competitions involving speedruns. To me, Scaleboy seems kind of choice for speedruns. So, have you thought about that particular aspect in the game's design? Not so, <laughs> Bjorn is a big fan of speedruns, and yes. I'm also watch all the time watching AGDQ and stuff. And we got a really good tip from someone on PAX regarding speedrun games. And he was like, 
don't try to build something in specifically for speedruns because that um, would always end up in a mess. And so we we always liked the idea of a speedrun. I think we just we just went with our initial design and didn't something did nothing specifically for speedrunners. But I would love to see a speedrun of Scalboy, and I'm sure people can pull up amazing stuff with it. <laughs> I just will mention that that dude you were talking about right now, um, that was Starkman78 from the Games Done Quick community. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> see at PAX East when I hung out with Fabian and one of the other guys oh gosh I don't remember his name that's gonna kill uh -oh. me but either way <laughs> I was hanging out with them at guy. PAX East no 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 PAX West in uh, the last PAX West and I specifically was like speedruns you gotta you gotta there's something here that like could really make a cool speedrun <laughs> Okay, that's oh. good to know. <laughs> I, I, I already know a good um, place where you can take a shortcut in the game. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> don't tell them. <laughs> no. <laughs> I found a couple little exploits here and there, but we'll see if the speedrunners pick it up. I, I love that kind of stuff, especially with all the charity and things they're doing. So I'm excited to see how that ends up going down. But I, I think a lot of devs anymore are not necessarily designing with speedruns in mind, but some of them are. It's more of a reaction to whatever speedrunners are doing. And just making sure that you're kind of tuned into that group. Because sometimes the speedrunners will be like, oh, there's this ridiculous bug, but we have a lot of fun with it. So if you patch it out, then it could affect the overall speedrun. And there's a decision-making process there, I'm sure. But it it's an interesting dialogue, I think. I'm convinced that speedrunners make the best QA testers. We have a buddy who does QA testing at Ubisoft. And I'm like, that's perfect because you exploit all these like platformers and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Nice. I think that's uh, something we have to decide when it's when it's due. What uh, kind of glitches we are patching out and stuff. We are already working on a patch uh, to get rid of some performance issues and some very um, yeah game breaking. There is a game breaking bug in the game. And we try to fix that one, but maybe we will see some speed runs in the future and see glitches and kind of decide, yeah, that's that's a good glitch, and it doesn't doesn't bother anyone. It's not like game breaking or something, and we can let it in. But that's uh, when we see it and uh, decide that one. So right now, a lot of the like press people, and I'm assuming some of the, the testers and close friends of your guys have copies, but the game does come out for everybody on the 30th of January, so this month when we're recording this. And I get, like, are you getting any good feedback specifically from that group of players? And is that helping out with just kind of like nailing down some of the, the bugs and such? Uh, we're getting a lot of feedback. Twitter, we, we're just watching Twitter all day now, waiting for all these Scalboy <laughs> hashtags. And some people are, are really nice and they, they reached out to us. Um, in Discord, I've got uh, two people constantly talking to me now if, if, when they find any bugs or stuff they noticed. And yeah, so because of that, uh, we created an open bug tracker where we just list all that so people can see what we already know and when we will fix that. Perfect. Okay. But it's a very positive conversation. So at first, it's always it's always a little disappointing for yourself if you hear there's a bug you didn't uh, catch uh, while beta testing or the performance stuff. Uh, but in the end, everyone is very positive about it, and it's it's cool to hear about that and get positive feedback, even with with those bugs. And it really helps to um, get the power to punch another another patch out for that. The only frustrating thing is that it always needs a little bit of time to get patches out. 
Yeah. It's such a cool era we live in now, because back in the day, if there was something inherently wrong with a game, there was really nothing they could do about it. Once it was set to print and put on a cartridge, that was kind of it. But nowadays, we can have, like, this sort of iterative process where after release we eventually get like the absolute best version of every single game almost and i just find it fascinating yeah, that's so crazy because um long long before i was someone who said like it's really dumb that you put games out with bugs i don't understand why people do this and very critical of early access and stuff but uh, the more you are working as a dev and the more you see the behind the scenes stuff that goes on, you kind of realize, no, that it's a very good thing that um, all those things are a thing today, like early access and like patching life and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm very critical of the AAA space in that regard, because I feel like there's plenty of games that's getting pushed out by executives that really needed about six months more time. So whenever all these delays are announced, even though... Apparently, a lot of them are really just extending their crunch times, which is awful. Uh, it is mm-hmm. good to see that they're not pushing these things to market as soon as possible because of the like upper management decisions or something. Yeah. Yeah. But but we are in, in a situation like that. We're just three people and Fabuas are three people. And then we got maybe a handful more people who test our game. And now suddenly more than a thousand of people play our game and they find things we never looked out before because it was just not possible. You, you, you play the game, there are so many combination of body parts you can, you can play and they <laughs> interact with each another and testing each combination in each situation of the game is it's really not possible with uh, some uh, so so less people that's why i think the like earlier you can do some beta testing especially in the multiplayer space is really important because then you have a large number of people giving you advice and giving you feedback and you can kind of use that to like pinpoint what exactly needs to be fixed when yeah i feel the same way it was also kind of it's part of the learning process i mean it's our first commercial game Mm -hmm. and next time we know we need an extended time for just beta testing because this time we really were close to the first uh, date of release we had in December and realized yeah that's hard to pull off and it got so close that um, even Nintendo was not the, the lot check was not able to go through in time and that was a big problem for us and we were really frustrated about that that we started to test so late and they found so many issues uh, we we all cleared them but it was so close to the to the first release date so we kind of were yeah we have to push that another month yeah and for anybody not aware of the context Skellboy was initially slated for a december release if i'm not mistaken yeah, yeah. correct Yeah, and then it was pushed back to January to iron out some of the issues you guys are talking about. So I guess since we're on the topic of development, I mean, what sort of advice would you have to other people interested in development or people that are doing small-scale publishing? Because I like to think that at the end of the day, we do have some people that are at least interested in development, and I I hope that developers get to listen to our show, because I think there's some really valuable context and information in these sort of chats. But what advice would you have for those people? Uh, I've got two advices. First, don't do everything yourself. I started out, like like uh, Sabaku told earlier, as a sole C++ programmer. I did everything myself, my own engines and stuff. And mm-hmm. yeah, the years uh, goes by if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> and the game is not getting finished. So this was our first commercial game. I did game development for a really long time, but this was, in fact, my first Unity game. So... Okay. And, and it all works uh, so nice and you can develop so much quicker. So yeah, you, you should really rely on some of these uh, modern dev tools, I think. Also, you s- should always uh, share your works. What us helped a lot uh, was uh, Screenshot Saturday on Twitter. You, you maybe know it. Oh yeah, that's one of my favorite tags that people share yeah, whatever it's, they're it's working great. on. It's great, it's great. We we share out almost every week uh, a nice GIF of our game and suddenly Fabuas um, DM'd me about the Switch release. So yeah, you, you should just show your game wherever you can. Yeah, I cannot emphasize that more. It's sharing your work is really important these days. There are so much games coming out and so much coverage of everything and um, you need to get out there. And I guess, Bjorn, if you have advice for specifically the music side of development. Oh, the music side. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, do whatever you think about. Like, if you if you are one of those people who hums a tune at work or at in your free time write it down somehow and make something out of it that's one uh, one thing that i uh, personally can uh, tell you is a very important thing to do then 
also get your stuff out there go get a soundcloud and put your stuff out on twitter and and on youtube if you have to and just share your work it's super important also communicate a lot uh, search yourself a nice community um meet some people talk with them for me the pixel dailies community is such a community where i learned a lot where i learned to put my work my my work out and my and my word out and i meet so many people who are also game there and they often they are like very um, they are not very sure in themselves they are like um i would do i would like to do commissions but i don't know if i'm good enough even when people go to them and ask them about commissions they are like nah i don't know if i'm good enough for that and i'm like someone asked you to do it so you are probably good enough <laughs> <laughs> It's so important. Get some self-esteem and do it. <laughs> These artists. <laughs> Just do, do, do one big jump and that could be the jump of your life, basically. Yeah, you never know where opportunities are going to come from. Exactly. My advice has always been just stay curious and be open to whatever might come your way. Yeah, that's also a good advice. Were there any particular moments in Skellboy's development where you're like, ah, from this point on, things are really starting to click together? <laughs> <laughs> so that would be uh, our first contract uh, contact with Fabras, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because in that moment, you kind of realize, wait a minute, there's some serious stuff going on. And after we sent out our kind of like a demo build, and they played it, and we're like, that's that's still cool. We still want to publish it. And we're like, are you sure? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> and okay. From that moment on, everything we did was very serious. <laughs> and we <laughs> really started to think, what was that initial thing that everyone is so excited about suddenly? <laughs> yeah, we thought, oh, now we have to finish this game, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, very, it's a very different feeling from when you... I mean, we were sitting down like, yeah, we can publish this on Steam. It's just like, what does it cost? $90 for... Uh, for a store page or something. Yeah, and if it doesn't go well, it doesn't go well. It doesn't matter. We will go on with our lives. But with a publisher, you really feel encouraged. <laughs> oh, definitely. So before Fabraz and them talk to you about publishing Skellboy, what were you all looking at for like your time of production to release on your own? Hmm. Oh, that's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a it's uh, ready when it's ready situation, huh? <laughs> Basically, kind yeah. of. I, I guess we said uh, uh, up to two years, maybe back then. I guess. Yeah, everything think, is kind of kind of in the dark now. <laughs> <laughs> Those no, were the but dark I, ages. I do yeah. remember something like two years of development time, which turned into three and a half years. <laughs> hmm, that's awesome. I've I've always wondered what happens right before people we get picked up by a publisher and like what's going through like developers and like dev teams' minds for that point in time. Yeah, so the game was in a, in a really big floating state for a long time. As Sabaku uh, told, we, we had this prototype for a game jam, which was kind of the starting area of the castle. And then we thought, yeah, we can do a full game out of it, but we didn't work full time on it. We just, in our spare time, it kind of floated or uh, half a year around the game. And, and then after Fabras came to us, we thought, oh, okay, now we have to actively work each day on this game to get it ready. And it's also like Jörn is working full time exactly, uh, right yeah. now. So he has like the weekend mostly to do the music and the sound effects. Um, I'm studying full time, but I, may, I took a brief pause for the final uh, phase of the game now. And uh, Chris was also at the beginning of the game, of the game's development. He was also studying, he made his master in programming and stuff. And now you're working full time. So we are kind of, so we, we are all very far apart. We don't meet each other, each other in, on, a, on our daily basis or something. We just chat over Discord and everyone has his life going on on the side. So it's kind of, you, you can't work full time every day on the game like that. And so the development phase was kind of, yeah, it can take a year or it can two, take two years depending on what is going on right now. Yeah, and we're pretty familiar with that kind of process because both me and Zach do have day jobs and then I've got lots of different irons in the fire. So Forever Classic specifically is something that, you know, we work in in our full time, try to put in as much time as possible. But at the end of the day, you got to take time for family. You got to take time to just chill. <laughs> I'm really bad about yeah. just like 
trying to do too many things at once and spending all of my energy yeah. there and then i'm just yep. exhausted <laughs> yep that's that's where i'm at right now i'm waiting for like seven more days and then hopefully everything like calms down by like seven stages yeah <laughs> But it's fascinating that a lot of the development did take place just over Discord because we see that more and more with a lot of the devs that we talk to and some of the things that I see in games journalism. A lot of different projects are just being done over a, an app or the internet. Yeah, and that's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, it's <laughs> really cool. So many people can work together. I remember whenever I did some very, very simple game design work for a, a project called Bane's Redemption years ago, and I was their lead writer at the time, so I worked on like their wiki and helped them do storylines and that sort of stuff. And we had a guy that did our programming in like India and then our other programmer was in California and I was in West Virginia. So we were just kind of like everywhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love that we live in an age where collaboration can just happen anywhere and anywhere. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's uh, very important. So you get, I mean, we are, we three are very specialized. Like Bjorn only does music and Chris is a very good programmer and I'm very much just an artist. A but very good doing, artist. <laughs> doing writing on the side. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> You're welcome. I mean, every one of us is very good at something. <laughs> and also it opens up the possibilities for much more diverse thinking and more different views on stuff. Also, when you are just asking for feedback online to something, some, someone offers their time to you to just give your feedback. That's also very valuable. And just works because we have this uh, networking stuff going on right now more and more really cool has there been anything specifically that you guys had to cut out of scale boy that you're like really wish could have been there oh man yes <laughs> <laughs> we have a full-on uh, trailer list just for stuff that we cut it out yeah I i've heard a yeah, lot of developers say uh, you gotta leave something for the sequel it's fine <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah 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 like basically everything that can be in the game part of it had to be cut out you could basically say that and we had to cut out areas or shorten them we had to cut out music we had but still some music is still on the soundtrack by the way that we had to cut out hmm. uh, we had to <laughs> cut some some bosses we had to cut out another body part that could have been um, exchanged, which were the arms. <laughs> oh, so another slot, so to speak. Yeah, oh, basically. This was cut really early in development. Yeah. Luckily. <laughs> I think uh, I was like, nah, um. <laughs> but but I, I truly wanted my dual arms, okay? I, I would get them someday. Yeah, I, I, I wanted my snake arms too, but yeah. I didn't get them. Yeah, and some Next time. some game modes like New Game Plus, but maybe we'll revisit uh, some of those in, in content updates or DLC. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe New the game, game will be super, uh, super, uh, will do super well. And yeah, then Plus we is something all that we really stuff. want to get in, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We really want to do more content, but we first just have to look how, how the game goes. How successful it gets. Yeah, it's that's another cool part of game design currently is that at the end of the day, things can be added later, and that's really neat. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Like, uh, so many games do that uh, uh, lately, and I love it. I love it le that Monster Hunter gets new monsters, or that, I don't know, uh, that's my on only <laughs> example right now, but I just love it that you can add stuff later to the game even when it's already out so i'm glad you mentioned monster hunter because zach and i are obsessed oh my god I, i'm <laughs> yes. i'm just playing through monster hunter world on pc just to get to, to, uh, to the iceborne dlc and ah uh, i don't have enough time i know there's a new <laughs> event happening now. i mean, i haven't fought raja i yeah, haven't fought Seth G yeah, or no, whatever. Ma music more music <laughs> <laughs> no i want to play Monster Look, Hunter. i want to no. i want to put in 300 hours into monster hunter again please <laughs> <laughs> not to detract you but god monster hunter is so cool <laughs> <laughs> it's so amazing it's such an awesome game i can totally see why it's the best-selling capcom game yeah, right now but that's the type of things that like there's a lot of lessons to be found in monster hunter reiterating something paying attention to the community adding things kind of constantly to keep people interested which is a huge undertaking but some companies are really pulling it off so for game designers there's a lot to be learned from monster hunter i think and there's some things to avoid yeah, like definitely. that co-op experience is not as seamless as it could be mm. Yeah, that's all I have yeah. to say about that. I, I can just say, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I love it, though. I'm glad every time a developer is like, oh, I love Monster, I'm like, ha-ha! <laughs> <laughs> I got you. It's so popular I now. I got you! <laughs> oh, boy. 
Yeah, we, we have big bursts on Monster Hunter and Metal Gear. Oh, oh Metal, Gear. Metal Gear, you've got me. Yes. Here I am. I love it. <laughs> just played the yes. first one for the first time probably two months ago. Uh, wow. Finally. Uh, wh- wh- which Such version? The GameCube version or the PlayStation version? I played the PlayStation version. one. The real or do version. you mean Metal Gear 1? PlayStation yeah, I played Metal Gear Solid oh, 1 on PS1 via the PS3. And I played it all in one okay. set. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I still prefer the GameCube version, but okay. You can you can have your PlayStation. <laughs> well, I owned the GameCube version <laughs> at some point, and I think I sold it because I was like, I don't really like Metal Gear. But nowadays, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I owned it. I need seven hours of cutscenes. It's so expensive <laughs> to just try to buy a copy right now. Well, Zach, do you have any final questions <laughs> yeah, here true. before we do kind of our wrap-up question? I'm going to go search to see if we have any, like, submitted questions from our community. Okay. So what are you all thinking, like, going into release? Like, what is your mindset for the next five days? Like, what's what's running through your mind, like, coming down to that, like, day one release? Please don't break the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically that. No, uh, so that's the first time we go through this phase. Like, and but it's like it's like with everything with Scalboy, it's the first time we weren't to PAX or like another games convention before. Before we had Fabres and Scalboy, um, we try to go in it with an open mind. So if you write a uh, so if someone is listening who's writing a review, just write your review and we will try to uh, deal with it, okay? <laughs> but give us some give us some time. We are new to this. <laughs> but we try to get everything out. Every bug you find, just just talk to us and we get it out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> or use the bug tracker. Or use the bug tracker. Yeah. Uh, do you want to link us your bug tracker stuff after the show in the uh, one of our chats here, and we'll link it into we'll our show you notes everything. too. Yeah, we can we'll give you all the twitters, all the all the bug trackers, and all the Discord links you need. Perfect. Yes. All the bug <laughs> trackers, <laughs> even for games that aren't ours. <laughs> We're going to have that not only in the show notes document, but it's also going to be in the episode description. Oh, uh, smart. Okay. But yeah, so in the in the note of this being like your first thing and it's a big first, I don't think we've got to talk to anybody about their like first release coming up, hasn't come out yet. I don't think so. I have it PAX, I think, so I think like right before something was released like a week or two after PAX. So I, I think I've had those conversations, but I don't think we've ever done one for the show. No, this is exciting, actually. So other than like your mindset, like, what is I don't know how to word this? Do it. <laughs> no, no, I'm blanking out now too. There are so many questions I had a minute ago, and I'm I'm just real excited, and I keep forgetting little ones as we keep going. Here's a culture one that I'm just kind of fascinated in. We've had a lot of different conversations with international devs, whether it be another indie from Taipei, China, or well, right now I guess Dave Oshery in uh, New Blood is in New Zealand, so that's another international guest technically. And then we just had a a, a guy from Thailand talk to us about his mech building game. So I, I kind of want to just understand gaming culture in Germany and what it kind of looks like. Not much different than in the US, I guess. Like, you, mm. we have... Oh, I don't uh, know that. <laughs> okay, no, we have... <laughs> since we're Germ- in Germany and Germans are always very... Um, pessimistic about stuff then yeah we have lots of people that go like uh this could have been done better and stuff but it's just more of that but it's still the same uh, so um, the problem in my mind is that the indie scene in germany is really small uh you have to connect really good with them uh i've got the feeling most people care about our game in, in america but in germany eh we, we have a lot of uh, questions. I think I gave an interview to some people from a Mexican from a Mexican magazine, right? Like mm, a yeah. sports magazine that occasionally talks about games. Yeah. And uh, another dude from Mexico and a lot of people from uh, from America. But if you want to have contact to someone in Germany, that's really really hard. Actually, I mean, we were at Gamescom at the Indie World booth and we had a lot of um, meetings coming up but in the end a lot of times they didn't even came there and we we were like okay that's crazy but uh, yeah I think now I don't know um, Germany is kind of late with also with financing and stuff like supporting local game developments and stuff we we are kind of behind I would say not not as worth as in other countries um, because Germany is a very is a very okay socially a very okay country so we are not poor or and have a very proper education up so everyone can learn programming if you want and do a game basically but we have like the German Games Fund 
something that is like just coming up for the second time this year. Yeah. So it's very new. Like uh, the on a national level, they invest like 50 million, 50 million euro for yeah, upcoming different. games. You can send in your project and maybe get a funding. But ec- that's that's pretty new for us. But it's growing. We we will get there. Okay. Oh yeah, that's something that <laughs> I. We, we also got uh, yeah radical fish games. Maybe you know them. Crosscode. They're also from Germany. Okay. Uh, Maybe. So we're trying. <laughs> that that's something that I think is going to be one of the bigger things that we see on a global level in various locations is that like whatever area you're in, here's some funding to support the arts in whatever area you happen to be in. Because I know here in Alaska, yeah. there's been at least one project that I know of that was funded by like the the Native American tribes. And the state of Alaska actually helped put together Never Alone. And so that was like this huge collaborative effort between them and and the tribes and their stories and how that all kind of came together was really cool. So that's the type of thing that I'm excited to see is like even beyond just the game circles, other circles getting involved, like your local uh, municipalities and stuff chipping in and being like, hey, we support what you're doing. Here's some money or here's some support. Video games are uh, becoming a real medium right now, huh? Like film and stuff. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> I think so, yeah. It's always been that, but it's starting to, at a global level, really start to be taken seriously, and I love that. Yeah, and also a lot of... It's it's so cool uh, when many when more people uh, can get support for their projects. Um, you get a lot, of, a lot more stories to tell and a lot more to see about different places in the world. I mean, a game someone makes in New Zealand or Africa or something is has much different philosophy behind it than a game that is made in America or in Germany. Just uh, that's that's a really cool thing. And I wanted to see more of that. I agree. I, I really enjoy seeing other people's perspectives through games. So I guess the last question then is for each of you, what has been the most memorable moment in Scale Boy's development? And we might have already touched on that, I think. Okay. So um, I think we all have the same me- most memorable moment. At least we agreed on that because um, it's definitely our visit to uh, PAX East um, because that was the first time uh, when we were there when Skullboy was shown off to the to a big audience. And it's just, it's it's one of those firsts that Sabi mentioned before. We it's It was the first time that we uh, went to another country, like the US in this case. And it was the first time that we uh, were at an expo where we showed off the game and just all the reactions from basically everyone i don't think we had just i don't think we had a single negative reaction to the game just positive ones and we met so many people that we talked to with beforehand or um that we just knew from the internet or whatever like from twitter or youtube like we actually um met um aaron hansen from game grumps that was pretty cool and he played the game and that's just everything that happened with the meetings, with people playing the game, being there and experiencing all that. I think that was definitely the most memorable moment that we had in, uh, during the development of Scaleboy Scale and really elevated us to no- another level where we definitely so- um, saw that we want to push through this and get this game out. I love meeting yes. all the developers and and creators and stuff and just kind of learning about them as people rather than how they present themselves it's almost always really cool because i've met so many different folks and they'll tell me like these really human stories involving in their work and it's just really empowering i think to know that side of it absolutely feels like we've got to meet some real fun sides of developers just being them like Dave Oshry and is eating what a cucumber or pickle? That, that was on a different podcast, but Oshry is a hand grenade. <laughs> yeah, it oh, was man. wild. What? That was awesome. <laughs> Look no further than his appearance on Games Done Quick during the a medieval run. For anybody that's already listened to our show, that's also a good taste of the type of person Oshri appears to be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Still gotta go okay. to that one then. <laughs> so we really enjoy having you all on the show. Like I said, it's always a treat for us whenever we can get developers. And the fact that you guys are here early, right before the game comes out here in the next week, is just really special for us. Yeah, let's see how we are, uh, how, the, how the emotional status is after the game is out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> emotional status dead. i'm sure it will be half panic half elation <laughs> oh definitely oh, yeah. <laughs> I, i'm i'm just counting down 10 days and then you're gonna look at it and it's gonna be like overall results very positive yeah <laughs> oh hopefully oh, oh yes so, yeah. please 
<laughs> so you can have that dead emotional state of happiness where you're just like able to sleep and relax. Yeah, like a skeleton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, Metacritic is fine, but I think Open Critic is a little better. So if you get a chance, look at Open Critic specifically. <laughs> I heard that okay. a lot, actually. It's becoming more and more prominent, and it was something when it first kind of came into the scene. I was like, wow, I like this better. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the difference? I think there's a bit of a uh, vetting open process. Critic is just, yeah, it's a different vetting process, and they, um, I think they um, weigh the results, the, the percentages differently than Metacritic. A little bit okay. more authentic, I guess. It feels more game-forward, rather than things like Metacritic, where you can have just about anybody, I think, can submit there. And then you have magazines that don't necessarily specialize in games publish their thoughts, which is fine if they have opinions. But it just seems like Open Critic is a more distilled, like, here's what the game reviewing community kind of thinks. Okay, the yeah. more you know. Yeah. And then, of course, you have Steam reviews in the future, but that'll be a different bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine that one oh. would be real different. <laughs> oh my god, I I am looking forward to all those Steam reviews and just I don't know. Not enough Bona Jones. Some of them are <laughs> bound to be funny. There, there are some <laughs> reviews that I look forward to um, that I can't mention specifically because of spoilers. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It'll be a cool time. Just to laugh about it. Got a random question before we go to then? Are you looking forward to like whenever you get on Steam? People modding your game in the workshop, or are you going to be open to that? I wouldn't <laughs> have anything against it, personally. Uh, I wouldn't against it, no. It's fine. <laughs> if, if people want to do it. Make your scale boy Thomas on. the Tank. Uh, oh, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Just the face. Just the face. That would be creepy enough. <laughs> There's something inherently sinister about Thomas the Tank Engine that I don't like. <laughs> he's it's the unca- he's it's freaking the creepy. Belly. Yeah. Yeah, it's the uncanny valley of it's his the that face on that log motive. It's just no. Why? Why does that have such a human face? It's terrible. I've seen so many terrifying. Clips. Oh my god! <laughs> Imagine the opening scene of Skullboy Bjorn, where you have the theater, and instead of a little skeleton coming out of the ground, you just it's hear Thomas the, the Thomas engine. the Tank Engine sound, <laughs> and he breaks straight through the wall, destroying everything in its path. <laughs> I want to see a Thomas the Tank Engine mod. Yes, that would be amazing. Make it happen, modders. <laughs> well, is there anything you guys want to plug before we cut out for the day? Oh my God. Search Skullboy on your favorite search engine and tell us think, what about, find. think about buying it and then you buy it and tell all your friends about it and your family and your foes. Oh yeah, and we also have we also have merch on the Yeti uh, <laughs> and we also have the soundtrack on Bandcamp uh, via Black Screen Records so check that out too and maybe buy it I don't know <laughs> yeah that's at the end of the day like buy the game please <laughs> yes buy the game it's, that's, it would, that's what uh, game devs keep uh, keeps us alive okay yeah. yeah anytime you can get out there and support indies and if you like what you're playing check out their merch because there's some very cute merch <laughs> like he was saying <laughs> and for context this is a $20 game typically but you can pick it up now for 18 i don't know when that's gonna change but 20 bucks so i i think even at this early stage of playing me and zach can both recommend it to just about anybody so as an official endorsement from a from a classic games like go check this out at the very least go watch the trailer oh yes. absolutely it's Yay. it's super well worth it all right well for everybody yes. else Thank you. if you want to <laughs> keep track of what we're doing here at forever classic games check out our website foreverclassicgames.com you can send us an email to our gmail account which is the Forever Classic Podcast at gmail.com. We'll have lots of things in the show notes. Primarily, it'll be a lot of links to the various folks that we have here today and the store page on the Switch, of course. You can also like hit that wish list button. I think that actually helps out a lot of different dev tracking tools and such. So yeah, yeah that, that'll be super cool. For anybody that's listening to the end of the episode, thank you. We've got a lot of things going on. A lot of work behind the scenes is happening and we just appreciate anybody listening to us and supporting these various developers developers whenever we get the chance to have them on the show so as always stay cool thank you for listening to forever classic games and that'll be it for us bye bye we did it